When gaming as a media was still in its infancy, game accessory companies were all looking for ways to enhance the gaming experience while being pioneers of a new innovation. Ranging from accessories like plugging a Game Boy Advance to your GameCube, or to the Sega Genesis Sega Activator, while many more examples of quirky controllers and accessories came and went, as time went on, problems arose when software and hardware developers alike found that designing these types of innovations typically fell flat. Either the controller was not up to par with first party controllers, or they were too different from it. While these type of quirky innovations are less commonplace nowadays, some of the more unique controllers of those times crafted unique experiences. Whether you like them or not, they were a brave step forward in uncharted territory that would lead to one of the most personal and intimate games ever made. The game that I'll be talking about today is called Lifeline. Lifeline was mostly developed by Konami, but Konami got a bit of help from a company called Scansoft. Scansoft started with a single man, Raymond Kurzweil, an American computer scientist who funded the Kurzweil Computer Products Incorporation. In 1974, his company developed the first OmniFont Optical Character Recognition System, which was a program that could recognize text in any reasonable font. Years later, in 1992, a company called Visioneer Incorporated would acquire Scansoft from Xerox. Thanks to this joint merge and the talent within both companies, they would be tasked to develop a speech recognition technology that would be used in a video game, which would be the premise for Lifeline. This microphone technology was both innovative and an irreplaceable controller to experience Lifeline, using it to not only enhance gameplay, but rather to be the main mechanic and the main driving force behind the game. While talking to a video game character had been done before, the people behind Lifeline wanted to take it as far as they could. It was just going to be about how far the concept could actually be taken. Manabu Nishizawa, the man who created Lifeline has little information about him online. From what little I could find, he's only ever directed three games, the last of which is Lifeline. From this, I can only speculate that this game was a sort of his ultimate artistic gift to the video game world. Before the game's release, there would be a Lifeline PC demo, which was advertised in the official US PlayStation magazine. The demo was a basic micromedia flash game that allowed the users to talk to Ryo before the game's release. The player would be able to test out voice commands like walk, run, and even ask Ryo to do a sexy pose. This demo, should you have it, can still be played to this day. If the player's computer's date is set between June 2nd, 2003 to February 27th, 2004, and played with the Macromedia Flash player. It can be played today with modern equipment. The preview opinions on Lifeline often praise its ingenuity, but do often mention that the speech recognition was lacking. From the US PlayStation Magazine, Konami sent us a playable version of Lifeline. It's still too early to say whether or not we like it or not, but one thing is clear. The game will live or die based on how its concept comes to fruition. Assuming Konami can work out the kinks in the next couple of months, this could be one fine sci-fi adventure. However, on release, these kinks were not ironed out as much as players would have liked. Reviews of Lifeline at the time can illustrate this. Overall, the voice recognition system is deep and mostly engaging. Some things work, others don't. Because of this, there's a mildly steep learning curve that's sometimes exciting and other times frustrating. It's only $40, but you can spend that on a game that truly feels interactive. Despite these reviews, there's a cult following that tended to either not experience these issues, saw past them, or saw the bigger picture, letting the atmosphere and the unique premise of the game captivate them. The game takes place on Christmas Eve of 2029, up in a space station. You've been invited to come to the space station, but through some events you don't remember, you are stuck in the space station's monitor room. This monitor room is where operators have access to all the cameras in the space station, as well as a way to communicate to employees remotely. You are currently injured and cannot move out of the monitor room on your own. This is before you come into contact with Rio, a humble waitress. Unlike you, she can act and move freely throughout the space station. You both agree that working together is the best way to save you from the monitor room. With your guidance from the monitor room and Rio's ability to act, this creates a unique relationship between operator and follower, and is the structure of the game narratively and mechanically. To do this, of course, you are literally meant to talk to Ryo 
and push you forward in the right direction to complete the game. This entire time, I've been emphasizing that this game could not exist without a microphone. However, this is only half true. The game hinges on your interactions between Ryo and yourself, your choice of words, her choice of actions, your reactions to her incorrect and correct choices. To me, this sounds like the writing was actually the true soul of the game. You would need to account for all the words people would say in a given situation, or write scenes in such a way that pushes people to a common conclusion, creating answers, solutions, or conversations that are relatable and that anybody can understand. A game needs a character that emphasizes these points, or in other words, you could say that Lifeline needed Ryo. If the microphone was one half of the game, Ryo was the other. Ryo was written to be this determined and compassionate character that is willing to fight for the player when they cannot. With no payment in return, all she asks is that you help her help you. She's willing to do this on her own, but instead, she trusts you, the operator, to be her eyes because she knows that together, you two can get things done. Of course, she can't be perfect. A believable character is an imperfect character. And as such, Ryo clearly was written to have her own thoughts, opinions, questions, and concerns that may clash with yours, and that's a good thing. Throughout the events of Lifeline, it's apparent that the writers behind it took their time depicting her as a strong yet fragile character and someone who reasonably relies on you to make up for her weaknesses. She truly is the perfect character for Lifeline. While I said that Ryo was the other half of the game, and the microphone is the other half, it's a bit more specific than that. One half of the game is Ryo, and the other half is the player. This game is ultimately a very intimate experience. It was clearly meant as such. Nothing is more intimate than talking to another person. Other voice controlled games do this and understand this concept well, but those games rely on conversations alone to create a level of intimacy. Lifeline, on the other hand, uniquely uses pressure, tension, and uncertainty to not only create a sci-fi thriller, but also to create a scenario where trust is created organically between the player and the protagonist in such a way that it's genuine. Pressure creates diamonds, after all. In my personal playthrough of Lifeline, I felt the feelings of uncertainty and anxiety when things were chaotic and dire. But I also felt feelings of relief when they were all over, and my thoughts went out to Rio where she must have felt these same things, but even more so as the one physically experiencing them. And I feel that is incredibly special. It's one thing to be immersed in this story and care for a character that you'll know you'll never meet, but it's something else when you do meet the character and you've got to know them organically. While Lifeline and the events of it aren't real, the effects of tension on me were. And when I felt this way, I sought to treat Lifeline as real out of respect for the vision of the game. Lifeline is so special to me that I don't feel, I know I can never play Lifeline for the first time ever again. A lot of the time I do feel this way for other video games and even movies and such, and I think of this as a bad thing, but in this case, it feels right. The events of Lifeline have come and gone for me. While you could say that I could re-experience the game again by simply playing it, I don't think it's that simple. On a first playthrough, the game relies on a connection that you would lack with Ryo in the beginning, with later on earning her trust and respect as a reward later on. To simply play the game again would take the impact out of this. While Lifeline has many more positives and negatives unrelated to that, I feel that not only do you lose the fun of this unique feeling, but on a second playthrough, it'll start to feel more like a video game. If I were to play Lifeline once again, I know that the Ryo that I'd meet would not be the same Ryo that I've come to know and trust but merely a memory of her. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Tell me about yourself. Um, I'm half German and half Japanese. My age, measurements, and hobbies are my business. Finish the chat. <laughs>